Hi, everyone. Well, over the past 50 years, the main goal of technological inventions for consumers like you and me was to save us time. And so things like fax machines and FedEx and ATMs and beepers and pagers, remember these Palm Pilots and modems, Wi-Fi, email instead of snail mail, microwave ovens, fast food restaurants, 10-minute oil change, PayPal, Venmo, cell phones, the internet, Siri and Google Assistant, and Amazon two-day delivery. In fact, did you know that in 1967, expert testimony was given to the United States Senate that said because of all the labor-saving technology that was on the horizon, people were going to have more time than they ever knew what to do with. They predicted that by the year 2000, the average American would work around 30 hours a week and 30 weeks a year. And so here we are, almost 50 years after this prediction, and does anyone feel like they're any less rushed? I mean, I doubt it. Because with all the technology, we're still scrambling and chasing. After what? I'm not sure. But you see, the key to life isn't efficiency, it's identity. It's ultimately not defined by what I'm doing, but who I'm becoming. And so when week two of this series called Analog Life in a Digital World, last week, Pastor Stephen challenged us from Psalm 119 that you become what you behold, and that we have to view technology in light of our relationship with God. And today, I want to talk about your identity. Who are you at the core? Who are you becoming? Have you ever asked yourself why you do the things you do? Like you're in a conversation with someone and that person isn't really hearing you and your energy intensifies and your pulse quickens and your blood pressure rises and you're saying, no, 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 you don't understand me, right? Or sometimes, you know, something makes you really sad and, and you sulk or pout or maybe even cry yourself to sleep. Or maybe something makes you proud and, and you try to work it into every conversation to make sure people take notice of your accomplishment. Or maybe you seize the moment to take a a verbal jab towards someone who's not there to defend themselves. Do you ever ask why you do what you do? I mean, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but usually we do what we do because we think what we think. And the reason we think what we think is tied to the issue of our identity. And so we try to change ourselves to be better through behavior modification instead of looking at the true issue of our identity. Who are we at the core? So today... I want to set the stage by talking about identity in general first, and then talk about how technology impacts our view of identity, and then I want to look at a text which I think will provide us some answers around this most important topic. So, if what you do and what you think ultimately flows from your identity, I think it's important to first look at, well, what is your identity tied to? And there are at least five things that I think we mistakenly center our identity around. One of the ways to diagnose which of these your identity is tied to is just to ask questions like, what do you find your success in? When do you feel most fully yourself? What what are you most proud of? What devastates you when it's taken away? What do you fear? All right. So here's the first thing that we tie our identity, identity to. It's what you do. So at most social meet and greets, this is the leading question we ask. What do you do for a living? Where do you work? Right? And if you're not careful, it starts to consume your identity. If your identity is tied too closely to what you do, your happiness is attached to achievement or success or the salary range you're in. Making sure that people see you as accomplished in your field and you hit your identity to, you know, well, I'm a teacher or I'm an insurance professional or I'm an equipment operator, or it can be more general. Your identity could be that you're a hard worker or, you know, you're the first one in and the last one out. Some of you have tied your identity to what you do. For others, your identity is about how you look. It's tied to your physical appearance. It really matters to you that that you're always put together, that your vibe is right, that that the the hair and the outfit and the accessories are on point. Uh, Again, a good diagnostic question to ask is, how do you measure success? And so in this case, your obsession becomes... Like, how many people desire you? How beautiful are you? What do the numbers on the scale say? Which angle of the selfies gets the most likes? And if your identity is in your appearance, then 
If something about how you look is affected, like you gain a few pounds or you can't wear makeup for a while or you, you don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend or you lose your social media followers, like for you, those things are not just hard, they're devastating because it's affecting your very identity. A third place that people tie their identity is, is to what you have. Like you define success by your possessions. You feel most fully yourself if you're driving the right car or wearing the right clothes or living at the right address or occupying the right house in the right neighborhood. It's what you're most proud of. It's what you flaunt. It's what you think about. It's one of your prized possessions. And if one of those prized possessions was ever taken away or out of reach for you, it hurts you to the core. And so for some, identity is tied to what you do. For others, it's how you look. For some, it's what you have. Here's the fourth source. It's who you're with. Like this is identity based on social status or peer groups or friend groups. I would put sexual identity into this category. I would put political affiliation into this category and where you come down on certain issues. The question here is, who are my people? And it could be a friend group or in a school or a cause that you believed in in college, or maybe it's the elite golf club or the bowling league or the next level up in your career path or the LGBTQ community or the no maskers and anti-vaxxers. Like you've tied your identity to a group that, that you're with. And finally, some of your identity is tied to where you're from. Now, this can go a couple of directions. One is geography. Like there are some people whose identity is tied to the fact that they're a city boy or a country girl. Others, it's about the town you grew up in or the school you went to. I met up with someone from Grace for Coffee last week who grew up in Erie, and, and we both asked each other what school we went to, McDowell and Prep. Now, only in Erie does that question mean which high school did you go to, by the way. But this can also be family origin. Like some identity is tied to the family concept. Like, well, in our family, we don't do this or that. Or my family is always believed, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think race and ethnicity also falls into this category. And, and when our racial identity becomes the primary focal point of our life and consciousness, it's easy for our identity to be tied to these things, where you're from. Now, let me be clear. All of these things make up who you are, like what you do, how you look, what you have, who you're with, and where you're from. None of them are bad. They're, they're all very good. And they all make a fantastic second identity. My point is that none of these things was meant to carry the primary weight of defining you. None is supposed to become the focal point of your identity. There is only one source of true identity, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, there's an interesting thing about identity. Psychologists would say that as we grow up, we develop our identity of self in two ways. One is internally. In other words, we develop our thoughts and our feelings and our beliefs using our own ideas and experiences. But identity is also developed externally. So we look for social feedback, academic feedback, outside cues that then shapes who we are. Now, here's the shift. In previous generations, most of the social forces that influenced our self-identities, the external ones, were positive. Parents, peers, schools, communities, extracurricular activities, even the media sent mostly healthy messages about who we were and how we should perceive ourselves. You remember these? Yeah, of course, but there are some of you, and I get it, who experienced bullying or a difficult home life, but, but for the most part, those external forces in our society were fairly positive. Technology has shifted how we see ourselves. So I wanna talk about the effect of technology on your identity. See, when the history books are written, they'll point to 2007 as a key turning point for humanity. Do you know what happened in 2007? Steve Jobs released the iPhone into the wild. It was right around that same time that Facebook and Twitter and a variety of other apps made their debuts. And we've shown you the statistics for this series, like the average iPhone user touches his, his or her phone 2,617 times a day. They are on that phone for two and a half hours and over 76 individual sessions. Now, that's for all smartphone users. Younger people put that number at twice that. So more like five hours and 150 separate times per day picking up this device. Most people surveyed had no clue how much time they actually spent on their phones. A similar study found that just being in the same room as your phone 
even if it's turned off, will reduce your working memory and problem solving skills. Translation, smartphones make us dumber. Simon Sinek said in a recent interview that our cell phones have the exact same addictive quality as, as drugs, alcohol, and gambling. And that sending our kids who may be struggling through the process of self-identity into their rooms to scroll their phones for hours on end is the same thing as opening up a liquor cabinet and telling them to have at it. And it's no accident then that mental health, mental health issues and problems among teenagers and college students and really our whole society have been skyrocketing. Depression, anxiety, social disorders are all on a meteoric rise in high schools and college campuses. Do you know when these trends started? 2007. Now, I said a moment ago that our identities are formed by both internal and external forces. And for generations, those external forces have been, for the most part, positive. Parents, siblings, peers, schools, churches, extracurricular activities that shape who we are. But here's what I want you to see. Since the invention of the internet and the smartphone, we've opened ourselves up to an almost limitless number of external forces that are trying to shape our identity. In other words, there are voices every day through this little device and it's always with us. This thing is in our bedrooms, it's at the dinner table, it's in the classroom, it's in our meetings, it's on our walks, it's at our parties with friends, and there's a constant voice coming through saying, this is what you need to know. This is who you should look like. This is how you should be. This is what you better think and believe. And more than ever, the sheer quantity of outside voices is shaping our identities. And more than just shaping, I want to contend for a moment that social media specifically tries to steal your identity. Now listen, we've promised from the start that this isn't going to be a grumpy old man series saying, technology's bad, I remember how it used to be. But, but everything is so new, and we're learning as we go, and we at least need to call out some of the dangers that we see so that we can you know, reach some sense of balance and putting this thing in its proper place. So there are at least a couple of ways that social media, I believe, tries to steal your identity. The first is this. It's the pressure to pretend. It used to be that all media prided itself in being unbiased. Media's job was just to, to hold up a mirror to reflect the ideas and beliefs of the population. That is no longer the case. The media has chosen sides. And it's now, like based on what you watch, pushing a narrative about what you should believe and how you must behave to be accepted in our society. So it's no longer like, here are the facts, you make up your own mind. Now it's, if you dare break away from these norms and narratives that we're prescribing, you will be canceled and ostracized. And so if you have an opinion on sexuality that doesn't line up or on COVID that doesn't line up, like you're in trouble. And as a result, social media then has cultivated a shift from a platform where you can express your own self-identity to being a platform where you need to fall in line with the status quo, whether you believe it or not. And so our kids and our adults alike are constructing facades based on what they think other people expect of them. Social media has become a place for measuring up and for virtue signaling about the trendy issue of the week. Social media takes those five things that I talked about earlier that we can tie our identities to, what you do, how you look, what you have, who you're with, and where you're from. And it not only gives a platform to celebrate and prioritize those things, but it allows you to filter them, to manipulate them, and to pretend that things are going better than they actually are in all of those areas. It's the pressure to pretend. And not only does it push us to pretend, but social media encourages us to compare. And unfortunately, you're comparing your mundane life to everyone else's highlight life. And we become envious. I just released a series of blog posts on, on envy, which I think could be really helpful for you. You can find them over at whoisgrace.com forward slash blog. And I'd encourage you to check it out. Envy is a sin that we don't talk about very much. But what it does is it gives you the ability, social media, to look at a TikTok influencer's whole vibe, like their whole aesthetic, which is highly filtered, by the way. And you say, if I can just get my apartment to look like that, and if I can get my meals to just turn out like that, and my clothes to take on that look, and if I can arrange my life to fit in to this highly filtered, contrived world, then I'll be happy. 
And if I can't reach that status, well then I'll just pretend. And so you have your own filters and you just go with it. And so they're pretending and you're pretending and there is this pressure to build our identity around make-believe stuff. But there's a second way that social media and technology tries to steal your identity, and that's the illusion of divinity. John Mark Comer talks about this idea that your device essentially gives you omniscience in your pocket. And if you're not careful, you can actually start to think you're like a god, that you don't need God. It makes us instant experts on everything. I'm amazed at how many immunologists there were in this past year. Like how many political scientists and foreign policy experts and racial justice historians. Like when we have all the knowledge of humanity in our pockets, it can start to mess with our sense of identity. And one of the things that we easily forget are our limitations. Comer points out that we are limited by lots of things. We're limited by our bodies. We're limited by our minds, by our giftings, by our personalities, our families of origin, our socioeconomic status, our education, our season of life our 80 or so years of life. And so God's call on our lives can, can be a limiter, actually. So we have tremendous potential, but maybe our limitations also aren't something that we should be fighting against, but that we should gracefully accept as God's means of assuring that we find our identity in him. And so, yeah, your device can be a useful tool. It can connect you with people. It can even connect you with God, but it can also try to steal your identity if you're not careful. And as we go to our text today, let me establish this big idea. It's just that. It says your device can't define your identity. Amen? So we're going to look at Colossians 3, 1 through 3 today. Paul's been establishing the fact that because of our new life in Christ, it means that we're dead to the things of this world. In fact, he said this in Colossians 2, 8. He says, because I think it's pertinent to our subject today, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. And so what he's saying here is avoid being deceived by the empty ideas and philosophies of this world. That might be the best description of social media in one sentence I've ever heard. But in our text today, he's describing a new life. So listen to Colossians 3, 1 through 3. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Verse 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Did you hear that? That summary, that conclusion at the end, your life is now hidden with Christ and God. Before Jesus, you lived for yourself, for your own pleasures, for your own glory, for your own best thinking, but your life is now hidden with Christ and God, which means you have a whole new identity. And so let's add a sixth option, if we could, to our list of what your identity is tied to. We said what you do, how you look, what you have, who you're with, and where you're from. I think Colossians 3 adds one more, and it's the right answer. That is whose you are. Your highest and best and ultimate identity is tied to Jesus. And so your device can't define your identity. We want to look at three ways that we can find our identity in Christ. Here's the first. It's to remember whose you are. Today's passage in Colossians, and if you read the whole book, you'll see Paul saying it again and again. Remember whose you are. Remember whose you are. Remember how God loves you. Remember how he poured out his mercy on you. Remember how he stepped into your life when you were spiritually dead and gave you spiritual CPR. The old you is dead, he says, but the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead is now in you and has given you new life. So remember whose you are. See there in verse one, he says, if then you've been raised with Christ, that's whose you are, by the way. You are the one who has been raised with Christ. He says, since that's who you are, then seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You will seek what you seek because you think what you think, and what you think is rooted in where you find your primary identity. And your primary identity is raised with Christ. It's child of God. You see, if your primary identity is what you do, and say, for example, you're a realtor, 
and the market shifts, and maybe you're forced into a different field. If realtor was your identity, that one move makes you feel like you went from being a somebody to being a nobody. Your identity was tied to that. But guys, I think we've all learned this year that your identity should not hinge on the housing market. Being a realtor can't be your primary identity. It's fine as a secondary one. But when the market crashes, your first thought shouldn't be, I'm finished. Your first thought needs to be, I remember whose I am. I am a child of God. I am raised with Christ. I am seeking the things above. And this circumstance, whatever it may be, is going to position me to do that in a different way because my identity is hidden in Christ. Do you see how this works? And so if you have a beautiful face or a beautiful body and you're scared to death of aging or gaining 10 pounds, the Bible says beauty is fleeting. It says appearance can't be your primary identity. It's unreliable. It doesn't last. You need to remember whose you are. You need to remember the truth of the scripture that says man looks at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. You are a child of God. You have been adopted into God's family. I just got done watching the historical fiction series from the History Channel called Vikings. It was a good one, by the way. But there was a practice among the Norse people, which was also common in the ancient Roman Empire where Paul was writing these letters. The practice was child abandonment. Like when a baby was born, it was set at the father's feet, and the father could decide. He either picked up the baby and claimed it, or he turned around and walked away, rejecting the baby. And maybe he wanted a boy and it was a girl. Maybe there was some kind of defect or birthmark that displeased him. Whatever it was, the child had full right to just walk away. And if the father walked away, the child would then simply be left out in the elements for the gods to decide his fate. Sometimes a child would be taken to the marketplace and was abandoned in the streets. Garbage dumps were filled with the remains of, of these babies. But occasionally someone would come along and they would take the child. In that case... Usually, that child would be raised to be a slave or a prostitute. So when the New Testament comes along and says that in love, God adopted us as his own children. In love, God has redeemed us and bought us back with his own blood and, and sealed us with his spirit and gave us the power of the resurrection and seated us and, and made us joint heirs with his own son, Jesus, that we are now hidden with Christ in God. Those words were written and read in an abandonment culture, a culture where unwanted babies were left for dead. And you can sense the shocking power of the biblical words there if you have come to know Jesus. Because now your most defining moment isn't who threw you out, it's who took you in. He's the one who picked you up. He picked you up and, and, and he took you home. And he seated you at his right hand. And if you're a Christian, that's what happened to you. And that is your identity. Since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. You can see that when this happens to you, it makes everything else like what you look like and where you work and what cause TikTok wants you to stand up for and your stuff and your sexual identity and your friend group and your race, those are all down the list. And so before you try to build your life around those secondary things, seek the things above. Remember whose you are. The second way to build your identity in Christ is this, is to be intentional about what you fill your mind with. Did you see there in verse two what he said? He says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So one of the key aspects in establishing your identity is where you'll fix your mind. And guys, your mind is getting bombarded minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, by all kinds of messages and images that will set your mind on the things of earth. Paul, in, in this case, in Colossians, was battling false teachers in this church. He was urging his people to be selective about what kinds of worldviews that they allowed to occupy their minds. And so on the one hand, you need to, to protect your mind. So many of the posts that you scroll through and the YouTube videos that you watch and the TV shows that you binge and the movies that you enjoy are providing endless messaging about your identity, enticing you to make your identity all about what you look like or who you date or where you work or where you live. They reinforce our worldly tendencies and they suck the spiritual life out of us. Let me ask it this way. How many of you find that prolonged television watching or prolonged social media scrolling helps to transform you to become a more energized, proactive human dynamo? <laughs> I don't think so. 
No, these things, they, they, they let the air out of the tires of our mind and souls. They say, no, 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 Derek, you don't have to think. You don't have to evaluate. You don't have to reflect or decide. You just sit back. You just let down your mental guard, and you let us tell you what you should think. You see, you're being discipled by the voices that you listen to. I'd urge you to do a little exercise. You ready? Just figure out how much time you're devoting to the voices in your life. So, so just look back at the last week and say, okay, just tally it up. I spent three hours this week reading Twitter. I spent six hours watching TikTok. I listened to four hours of podcasts about my favorite topic. I spent two hours reading the New York Times. I spent four hours on Facebook. I spent six hours watching cable news. I spent five hours watching my favorite YouTuber, whatever it is. Now, now throw your spiritual input into the mix, the Bible and worship music. Okay, was it one hour a week, maybe two, maybe three? Listen to a sermon on Sunday, 30 minutes, 35? But if you get all that data in one place, it's easy then to evaluate who's discipling you. What are you filling your mind with? And guess what? Your behaviors are soon going to match up with whoever is the primary voice on that list. So you need to understand what you're filling your mind with. Paul also says that you need to set your mind. You hear how proactive that is? You need to point it toward a target. Don't just starve it from negative influences because your mind remains hungry and so feed it with positive food. Dallas Willard writes this, he says, the ultimate freedom we have as human beings is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon. You will only find your true identity in Christ through the renewing of your mind. And I'm just old enough to remember this old fashioned thing called boredom. Anybody remember this? <laughs> it was super popular back in the 80s. <laughs> For you millennials, probably the closest parallel I can point you to is like having really bad Wi-Fi for 15 minutes. Now multiply that by a lot, and that was boredom in the 80s. Now, but, but each little boredom, for those of us that lived through it, was a potential portal to like creativity and thinking, maybe prayer if you're spiritual. It, it was a moment to wake up to your own thoughts for a minute. And today, we don't even do that. Like the second you feel even a hint of boredom coming on, you reach for your phone, you check your feeds, you answer an email, you read a tweet about someone's offensive tweet and then you get offended. You look up the weather for Thursday, you search for a new pair of shoes, you totally slay Candy Crush. Uh, you, a, a survey from Microsoft found that 77% of young adults answered yes when given a chance to agree with this statement. Ready? When nothing is occupying my attention, the first thing I do is reach for my phone. 77% of people said, yes, that's what I do. This has a profound effect on our ability to set our minds on things above. The noise you see of our modern world makes us deaf to the voice of God, drowning out the, the, the one voice that we actually need. And slowly our identity becomes established in the stuff, in the people, in the job, and we forget whose we are. Guys, your device can't define your identity, and yet we're giving it every chance to do so. I believe that we all have time to fill our minds with good stuff. Charles Chu did a study. He figured out that the average American reads 200 to 400 words per minute on average, which means that if we committed just over an hour a day, that's 417 hours per year, to reading, we could all read about 200 books in a year. Can you imagine that? So that's in 417 hours. And you say, well, I don't have that much time. Do you know how many hours Americans spend on social media per year? 705 compared to 417 that it would take to read 200 books. How about watching TV? 2,700 hours. So in just a fraction of the time that we spend on TV and social media combined, we could all become avid readers. What we're not coming to grips with is the fact that we're too addicted and too distracted in where we set our minds. We don't have a time problem, we have a focus problem. The Catholic father, Ronald Rollheiser, said, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. And so Paul says, set your mind on things above. One of the ways that we do that is to regularly expose our minds to scripture, especially scripture that may speak to your identity. And I'd encourage you to use that list of five things that I mentioned earlier. Would you just pick one of them where you're most tempted maybe to find your identity? And a good way to diagnose this would just be to ask yourself, like, what do I fear most? 
So, so if you fear not being provided for, not having enough, maybe your identity is in your stuff. Or if it's you fear getting fat, maybe your identity is in your looks. If it's you fear losing your job, then maybe your identity is in your work. But once you've identified the one, begin to collect up scriptures to, that speak to that thing. Use Google, use a concordance. Look up scriptures in God's word and slowly and surely renew your mind with the truth and allow God to strip away those things that define you. Because listen to verse three. Four, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's the third way to root your identity in Christ. It's to live in step with God. You are hidden with him. You become one with him. It's like you can experience a small foretaste of heaven on earth because you're in step with God himself. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Can I just remind you of that truth? The Holy Spirit is in you. And so walk in step with him. Listen for his voice. Your whole identity is hidden in him. You are his. And so maybe you're in a dating relationship that you thought was headed toward marriage, but lately it's become very clear that it's not. And you're broken and you're lonely. Listen for the Spirit's whisper as he says, you're mine, you're mine. Or, or maybe you're driving down the road on a warm summer night and the sun is setting in the west and you're captivated by the orange and yellow and red and something stirs in you, something transcendent. And you know that it's God who made all this. And, and, and as creation explodes in front of you, you hear him whisper, you're mine, you're mine. Maybe you find yourself in a funeral home and you were not ready to lose this person. And you're crushed and broken, but through your tears and in your grief, you hear the familiar whisper, you're mine, you're mine. Guys, this is who you are at your core. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. This is your primary identity, not your house, not your job title, not your children, not your looks, not your sexual identity, not your ethnicity, not what Twitter tells you. And when you remember to live in step with God as your true identity to your fundamental core, it is then that you are free. Like you're free from the pressure. You're free to parent without needing your child's approval and affection every second. You're free to age with grace. You're free to seek a new career opportunity. You're free because you know whose you are. And when you learn to think this way, you can see how insignificant your devices become in establishing your identity. Yeah, this can be a tool for good. It can be a tool for connection. It can be a resource for encouragement or research or efficiency, but your device can't define your identity. Only Jesus can do that. So let me challenge you with two next steps today. I've given a lot of practical ideas throughout this message, so please do some of those as well. But I wanna point you to an interesting tool that we've put together for this series. It's called Screen Time Diagnostic Tool. You can find it over at whoisgrace.com slash read. And it's gonna help you to get a handle on how your devices are impacting you. And it's gonna give you some suggested practices. The second is this. I'd like to invite you to join Pastor Stephen and I and some of our staff and leaders this whole month as we do the Meal Time Challenge. Now, that means no screens during meals. Turn them off, put them away, get them out of there because your device can't define your identity. I love you guys.